That's a quite a text, and that's part of what we get to study this morning. My name is Josh, and I'm a pastor here at Redemption North Mountain. And we are walking through the book of Nehemiah. It's a it's a meaty book, and we're actually taking big meaty chunks out each week. We're doing this whole chapter, so we're actually going to teach nine, verse one, all the way through verse thirty. Seven. I'm going to stop at 38 because it goes with next week. So here, just to give you kind of a grounding on where we're at. So the first five verses here is the people of God preparing for this moment. What Chandler just read is the moment that we're going to kind of camp out on. It's this confession. It's the longest prayer in the whole Bible. It's the longest, most robust, most thick prayer we have in this entire book. And it's them confessing to God all that they've kind of, what you just heard Chandler. And then after, well, I'm going to land on the plane is now after their prayer of confession, they land and they're sitting in this moment, the time of Nehemiah, the walls are rebuilt. Some of the people are back. They're not in houses yet. They've got a temple. They've got semblance of a religious community, yet it's not quite what it used to be and it'll never be what it was. Now what? So we're going to talk about all those things as we walk through this passage. But the title, which uh, we made just kind of months ago, is The Confession. So here's kind of what we've been doing. No, go back to the all the t- there we go. So we are on the confession, Nehemiah 9. We've got two more weeks left in Nehemiah, then we're gonna jump back into the Gospel of John. So we're talking about the confession. So when you hear confession, something comes to mind. And I was Googling what are the best public confessions of all time? Like, what are the best, we just had an incident, and I follow a lot of ESPN, like, way too much. It's a sin. I confess in front of you. I apologize. Uh, There was an issue with a football player, with his family. He did some stuff he shouldn't have done, and he had a confession. I screwed up. I need to get mental health, all that. But what's the best public confession of all time? Some of the names that got brought up, not best, like, they nailed the confession part, but just kind of like, wow, Lance Armstrong. We got a lot of cyclists in here. Lance Armstrong basically what, he met with Oprah. She said, did you take this? Yes. Did you take this? Yes. Did you take this? Why did you do it? Everybody was doing it. Great confession, Lance. But that was essentially what he said. Everybody did it. Everybody got away with it. That's just how it was. And I was the best at cheating. And now I'm confessing kind of. That's Lance Armstrong confession. Bill Clinton. I don't remember this. I was a little kid. But he confessed. Here's verbatim what he said. Sir, still, I must take complete responsibility for all my actions, both public and private. That's why I'm speaking to you tonight, to the people of America. As you know, in my deposition, January, I was asked questions about my relationship with Monica Lewinsky. While my answers were legally accurate, I did not volunteer information. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. It was wrong. It was a critical lapse in judgment and personal failure on my part. The public confession of a president of this great country. One of my favorites of all time, because it's so silly, Mark McGuire. He took a lot of steroids, like more than any human should ever take, and he hit a lot, a lot of home runs. And he's standing before Congress. Well, he's sitting at the time, and he's giving a deposition, and they kept asking him, did you take steroids? And this was what he kept saying, I'm not here to talk about the past. His way to say, I did it, but I'm not here to talk. Mr. McGuire, when exactly did you start taking steroids? I'm not here to talk about the past. Probably the best as far as sincerity and people like rallied around as Marion Jones, former track and field star. She owned it, same, doing drugs, but her, this is hers. It's with a great amount of shame that I stand before you and tell you that I've betrayed your trust. I want you all to know that I plead guilty to two counts of making false statements to federal agents. Making these false statements to federal agents was an incredibly stupid thing for me to do, and I am fully responsible for my actions. I have no one to blame, only myself. I did this. To you, my fans, and including my young supporters, my closest friends, my attorneys, the most classy family a person could ever hope for, namely my mother, my husband, my children, my brother, my family, my uncle, and all my extended family, I want you to know that I have been dishonest. You have the right to be angry with me. I've let you down. I've let my country down. I was wrong. That's a confession. That's a good, not, I'm not here to talk about the past, not Lance Armstrong, everybody's doing it. It's, I did this. And when we church people, people that have been in the kind of church game for a while, think about confession. I think they think about that sort of confession. Somebody messes up and they come clean with what they did. To God, absolutely, but also to their people, their spouse, if that's the person. That's what we see in these confessions. Somebody got caught Somebody comes clean. What we see in this Nehemiah passage is different. It's not people getting caught. It's a more proactive, sort of communal, like let's do this together 
confession. Not like, hey, we got caught. Let's now come clean so that the gods will be happy with us. It's like, let's build this into the fabric of our DNA. We are a confessing people. Because the word confess comes from a Latin word. It just means acknowledge. So what is a confession? It's an acknowledgement. Acknowledgement of what? Most definitions, if you go to you know, Webster or whatever, it's a confession of a wrongdoing, which is good, but it kinda, it, the word is more broad. It just means acknowledge. What do you acknowledge, Marion Jones? What do you acknowledge, Lance Armstrong? What do you acknowledge, Redemption North Mountain? What do you acknowledge, Joshua? What do you acknowledge? And in the church, we acknowledge kind of two big things, who God is and who we are. Like, one of, in my old church, one, one, one young kid, 17-year-old kid got saved when this passage was read out loud like Chandler just did. It's out of uh, Romans. If we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And the light bulb went on. That's what I got to do to become a Christian? Yes. So if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, you're figuring out faith, you wandered in here because somebody invited you. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is, that confession will get you saved. You are now on God's good side. You have his favor. You are forgiven of all your sins. That's a confession. Likewise, probably the most famous, and if you have a verse memorized on confession, it's probably this, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If you've screwed up in any way, God says, confess, and he is faithful and just. He will forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's a confession as well. Confessing who God is, Jesus is who he says he is. Confessing my sin is what it is, and you will be cleansed if you confess. But again, Nehemiah here is this. This is a people, just a little reminder, has thousands of years of history with God now. They are back in their land finally, and they are a shell of what they used to be. And they are praying through, thinking through, strategizing Nehemiah as a sort of great general contractor. How are we going to rebuild as the people of God here on this earth, placed here by God with a mission? How are we going to do that? And they say, one of the main things we need to have is a confession. We can't move forward without confession. Like, just think about personally, in your marriage, if there's been something that's breached the trust, you can't just say, well, let's just push it over here, and let's get on to these other things and build a great marriage. Why? Because you skipped the confession. Me as a dad with my kids, when I lose my temper, which happens, when I parent out of just my own comfort, which happens more than I like to admit, and I don't confess to my kids, it builds sort of these walls. You've got to confess. The people of God, if you're going to rebuild, if you're going to do anything substantial, there has to be confession. And not just an individualistic sort of, I confess to God my sins, therefore I am forgiven and I'm going to heaven one day, which is, I think, what most of Christianity makes confession out to be. But in this, we see the people of God gathered around his word together saying, we, we confess the sins of ours and the sins of our fathers. So here's what we're going to talk through today. Here's my big idea, and I'm going to just walk through it kind of phrase by phrase. A robust, I like that word I used to use it in teaching, a robust means thick. It's like full. Confessional life is communal, it's God-centric, and it's an honest evaluation that reminds us of our need for mercy. That's what we're going to do as we walk from chapter 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 1, down through verse 37. It's communal, it's God-centric, it's an honest evaluation, and it reminds us ultimately that we all need mercy. Amen? But let me pray for us real quick as we dive into this text. God, uh, we don't want to just be pious or religious or liturgical or have the right church structures and tools and without the right heart. So God... Whatever you need to do to make our hearts more in line with yours, more in love with you, more aware of our own sin and reality as we stand before you as your people. God, by your spirit, even though we see in this text, your spirit's the one leading and moving and guiding. Guide us this morning, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, here's the first thing. Communion is communal. Does that mean you should not confess one another? No, that's absolutely not. Does that mean the Catholic style of confession is inherently wrong? I would say it's, it misses a lot of points. So one person going into a room with another person to confess their sin 
James talks about confess your sins to one another so you might be healed. There is biblical merit to that. But as we talk about being the people of God, we are talking about a communal response. We're not talking about individual response, and we're not talking about sort of anonymous. Like, I don't know if this is still around. Ask FM was a social media deal back when I first started youth ministry. And it was the dumbest thing in the world. As you could sign up, and everything you said or asked or did on that was completely anonymous. And it's where all my youth group kids used to go to just splatter all their stuff because they wanted to be anonymous. We're not talking about individual or anonymous confession. We're talking about a communal public in this moment, this room, standing and confessing to God. Where do I see that? Let's read verse 1. Chandler didn't read this. Now, on the 24th day of the month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all the foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of it, they made confession and worship the Lord. We'll pause right there. The 24th of the month. Here's what happened. They just had the Feast of Booths. That's the celebration where they kind of live in tents for seven days. They have an eight-day assembly to remember when they were in the wilderness and God provided. That day ends. There's one day that happens that's kind of free of everything. And then this day is one day after that. And they're there and their posture has completely changed because the Feast of Booths is all celebration. All party, all the joy of the Lord is our strength. Even last week as we looked at it, they started to cry as they heard God's word read. And Ezra said, stop, now's not the time. We have an assembly. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Let's celebrate the Feast of Booths. That has come to a close. One day has happened, and now they're on this day. And now the posture is completely changed. Second thing we see, they were assembled. Like they gathered again together. They got to church. And again, um, this is a conviction that I've grown to think that I will never change. And that's bold to say when I'm not even 40 yet. But I 100% believe that the people that have the fullest lives are the ones that make church a priority. Like, as I meet with a lot of young people, they're like trying to figure out kind of the boulders in their life that matter. I really want to get married. Yes, that's important. And i got to figure out my job, and i got to figure out my vocation. And I meet with older and older folks that are retired, and they're now figuring out kind of on the tail end, all those responsibilities aren't mine. What's, what's kind of priority? Whatever spectrum or people group I'm meeting with, here's the reality. Church is not a given for most people. And you're like, well, you got to say that. You're the pastor. Yes, I do have to say that. But I also feel like I'm a doctor who knows you should drink water. And, like, I'm just not going to bow and say, you know what? All right, if you don't want to drink water, you can have Coke. That's, that's probably just as good. There's a lot of water in there. <laughs> you have to go to church. And nobody's taking attendance here. Nobody's like, but it's just the people of God assemble together. We see it. They got together again. They're all doing their thing, and they come back and assemble. They just had eight days. Like if my wife said, all right, babe, I want to have people over for eight straight days. My high school buddies, my college buddies, my Texas friends, our married people, the young singles of the church, seventh day, we'll, be, we'll kind of roll the dice, figure it out. The eighth day, we'll have all the people with issues in our church come over. And then, all right, you get one day break, and then let's assemble back together with them. She would divorce me in a hot second. <laughs> Why? Because you can't assemble that much. But the people of God are supposed to assemble. Here's what I say, just make church your priority. And again, if this is not the church for you, then figure out what church is and assemble there. This is a chart, it's going to be hard to see, but in the middle of the pandemic, COVID, all that, they did this this survey, which was fascinating, about mental health. And mental health, however they gauge your mental health grade, started here at the beginning of COVID. At the end of COVID, every number dropped except for this one category of people. And it's only the people that went to a religious service weekly. Their numbers increase in mental health. Everyone else, I went to church every couple weeks, they dropped. I was single. Every person dropped except for the person who made church a priority. What do we make of that? 
And that's not even saying that's like a gospel-centered, Jesus-teaching, Bible-opening church. That's just they went to be with people gathered around a religious identity. It ma- that's who we are. We're worshipers and we're communal. We need to be together. So go to church. Make church your rhythm, a natural part of your rhythm. Two passages just to kind of, Hebrews 3.13 says this, Exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today. Why? That none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Why do we go to church? Because if you don't, your heart is hardening. If you're not around the people of God, helping you to have a soft heart towards God and towards people. That's just the flow of mankind and how we work. Hebrews 10 says this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Why else do we get together? To encourage one another. From the pulpit, yes. From people leading worship, yes. From just interactions in the lobby, whatever it is, to encourage one another. Go to church. What is church according to this passage? This is kind of interesting, but... Verse 2, what's it say there? Who are we talking about assembling? And the Israelites separated themselves from all the foreigners. Like there is a separation between followers of Jesus and those who are not following Jesus. In this day, it was Israel, ethnic true Israel, and the foreigners that were living. And they separated themselves and they said, this is a family deal. This is a Jewish deal. For us, it would be this is a church deal. We need to do church business. So when we're talking about confession, we are confessing as a church, the church, the people of God. Like one of the most fascinating, most clarifying passages about this is in Corinthians. Paul's walking through all the sexual immorality he's dealing with. And he he says this, I don't expect you to disassociate with all the sexually immoral because then you'd have to leave the world but I expect you to disassociate with the sexually immoral who are in the church. Translation, don't worry about people who are not followers of Jesus and what they're doing. Worry about us first. The Old Testament says this, we start with the house of God. Jordan Peterson, this Canadian professor, everybody's talking about, so I read a book to kind of figure out, okay, what's the big deal? And he's, you know, great, clear, conservative Whatever. I, he talks a lot about Jesus. I don't get the sense he loves Jesus. But he said, one of his chapters on his 12 rules of life is deal with your house before you deal with the world. That's what we're seeing here. Like Israel, this is for us to figure out. All the foreigners and immigrants and refugees that have found a home with us, which is good, they need to leave for a second. We've got some business to do. Close the doors. This is a people of God thing. This is a church thing. This is a Redemption North Mountain thing. And what did they gather around? Again, they gathered around the book. They read for a quarter of the day, hours upon hours of Chandler Cruz reading. And then they confess for a quarter of the day, hours upon hours of all that gets evoked in them because of what they read in God's word. Isn't that fascinating? We are the people. This is a communal thing. I should confess to Aubrey when I sin against Aubrey. But a natural part of our rhythm as the church should be a communal coming together to confess to God who he is and confess to one another who we really are and our sin. That's just how we get shaped as the people of God. Now, here's the thing, though. With all those sports confessions I read, like, the content is very thin. There's a mess up, and you kind of admit to a certain amount of it, and then you try to move on. As we read this, like I said, this is the longest prayer in the entire Bible. What is at the center of the content of their prayer of confession? That's the next thing we say. Confession is communal and it is God centric, is our next point. We're going to look at verse 6 through 15. Like, I just want you to think about you personally. The last confession you had in your life, like legit confession. You screwed up, you owned it. Like, the content. The core content of what you said as you confessed. Here's what I think most of us do. This is what I, there's like a shame element. Oh my gosh, I'm such a. Oh, so good. There's a guilt element. There's a fear element, and like your screw up is kind of the center character of the story. But the people of God have gathered hours upon hours of listening to God's word, and they start the confession. And where do they start? Look at verse six. This is the very beginning. 
of the longest confession, longest prayer in the Bible. Verse 6, you are the Lord, you alone. Let's pause right there. Confession, great confession is not tears upon tears and remorse over your sin and guilt and shame and all the feelings coming out. That may be part of it. But great confession also realizes you are confessing the reality about who God is in that moment despite our shortcomings. You are the Lord. You alone. Where does your confession start? It starts with God. Period. Like even disciples, Jesus How do we pray? How do we do this? Our Father who art in heaven, start with God. How do we do it? Will you start with God? Start with God. And then what's the rest of the content? As you look at verse 6, even all the way through verse 31, here's what uh, Ezra does as he uh, puts this together, and he's probably the one vocalizing this prayer on behalf of the people. He basically walks through the story of God. It's fascinating. Like verse 6, it's creation. Verse 7 and 8, now Abraham. Verse 9 through 15 is the story of Moses. Verse 16 through 32 is now the people in the land with kings and prophets and then trying to figure out. He walks through. He tells the story of God. How do you confess? Start with God. And how do you really get good at confessing? You walk through the story of God. Let's just walk through it together. I already said the first part. You are the Lord. You alone. Start with God. What's God do? You have made heaven. The heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heavens worships you. You created it all. Fascinating, as I'm reading and studying on sort of gender issues and sexuality and preparation of future series we're going to do, like the main theme in stories of people that choose to repent of sexual sin and gender-specific issues and like maybe even detransition back to their birth gender, almost without exception, they had to come to terms with this. There's a creator. He created me. He created me this way. I feel this way. I'll go with what the creator said. Confession starts with God and his story, and his story starts with he created all things perfect. The heavens and the earth and the animals and the seas and everything. And it was beautiful and poetic and wonderful. And then he placed us, man and woman, at the center. It's like the centerpiece of this masterpiece. You created all things. Verse 7, you are the Lord. Sin comes in and then what's he do? He keeps going after people. The God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. What's he do? That's Genesis verse 12, Genesis verse 15. All the nations now, it's after the Tower of Babel, so there's many languages, so people can't quite understand each other. You have people speaking this, people speaking this, people speaking this. How is God going to continue to move into humanity and be close with him? He's going to choose one person, one tribe, one family, one name to bless the whole world through, and he chooses Abram, and he changes his name to Abraham. Verse 8, you found his heart faithful before you, and you made with him a covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. Like God has never had to repent once. Like think of all the times where you overpromised, spoken away, where you kind of would want to get that back. Like just in the last two days. Just in interactions with my wife as we're discussing stuff, I'm like, there's like a dozen things I wish I could kind of tweak, recolor, recollect. God, you are always faithful. You've always kept your promise. You are righteous. Everything you do is good. And that takes us to Abraham. Who's after Abraham? Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. End of Genesis. Then Joseph gets taken into Egypt. And then they become slaves. And now they're, according to estimates, 2.5 million Jews as slaves in Egypt. And they pick up the story, verse 9. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. You saw them and you heard their cry at the Red Sea. God hears and he sees. And you performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all of his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. 
And how's he getting out of there? Miraculous acts. Verse 11. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land. And you cast their pursuers. That would be Egypt coming after them to bring them back into slavery. And he cast them into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. Now they're out on the other side of the water. Now what do we do? How do we do this thing called life? We've only known slavery. Verse 12. By a pillar of cloud now I will lead you. You led them in the day. And by a pillar of fire at night to light them... Light for them the way in which they should go. And you came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath. And you commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses, your servant. Not only did I teach you how to live, I also provided, verse 15, and you gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water out for them out from the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. Here's how I prepare for a, to preach a passage out of the Bible. I print it out on a Word document. This one was three pages long. And then I have colors that kind of blue is setting. What's, what's, what's the setting? Green is what are the people doing in this? Red is when God's doing something. And in this section, this is all red. As I had these three pages out, this is all red. Red, red, red. God did this and God did this. God created. God chose. God pursued. God went after. God redeemed. God rescued. God chose them again. And he went with them and led them. And oh, he provided food. Like God, 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 God. Who's the center of the story? God. How do you confess? Did you screw up with that thing that you know right now? If I was to make all of us like confess publicly and you were like, I would not want to say that in public. Yes, that sin is important, but do you know how to confess all the mighty deeds of God? Like, that's confession as well. Acknowledging God for who he is. Our lead pastor at Redemption Gateway, my old boss, went on a sabbatical probably three years ago for... 12 weeks, and he came back and he said, here's the one takeaway I have from this. So the church wasn't like a natural rhythm. He said, nothing in this world, nothing in this world, nothing in this world is reminding you of the transcendence of God like the local church. God did this. God did this. God did this. Confess all the mighty deeds of God. God. Like, just spend time talking about God the creator. Read Genesis 1 and spend your, that can be your confessional time. God created all these things. Confession is God-centric. Here's the next thing. Confession is also an honest evaluation. Now that we kind of turn, we're gazing upon God, and now we look in the mirror, and now we got to come to terms with what you see. So as I prepared this, now my paper switches. Now we have green what are the people doing? Red. How's God? Green. Red. And I have a ton of green in this section because now the people of God get inserted and it's not good. It's all their sin. Now, here's just something interesting. So Genesis 1 through Abraham. Now we get to Moses. Now the people of God are past Mount Sinai. They have the law, and this is where the story picks up. And now this person in Nehemiah starts to talk about their sin. Why now talk about their sin? Like Adam and Eve sinned. Their kids sinned. Every person you read in the Bible sins. But as we have this huge confession, this, the longest prayer in the Bible, we don't get sin talked about until we're dealing with the people of God post Ten Commandments to give you a simple reference point. That's interesting. And I think it's for this reason. God made a covenant with Abraham. Genesis 15. Here's how that covenant went. God put Abraham to sleep. And he says, you go to sleep. And God did all the ritual and ceremony for that covenant as a way to say, this covenant is solely on me. I'm going to do this. The blessing of the world through this man and his seed is going to be done solely because of me. It is absolutely my doing. Fast forward, now the Mosaic covenant, the covenant the people of God, Israel, makes with God after the Ten Commandments is now a sort of bilateral. It's like a wedding. It's a husband and a spouse. God saying, I'll do this, and the people of God saying, I'll do this. And they got, it's interesting, you can go back and read it, but they get on the tops of these mountains and they talk about, we will do this. And it's just hilarious because it's like, if you have kids, it's like, I will never, ever 
ever disrespects you ever again, Dad, ever in a million years, ever, ever, ever. And the little brother's like, yes and amen. That's what Israel does. They're like, we will never. That was old us. We're new us. Verse 16 is Israel showing their true colors. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously. And they stiffened their neck and they did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. And they stiffened their neck and they appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But... You are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and you did not forsake them. Let's pause right there. What do I mean by honest evaluation? I mean being specific with the language on what you did. Like, here's what I do in confession. You may not, you may be better than me, but I kind of fuzzy up the words to kind of end up cleaner than I should. Like, I I kind of screwed up, like... You know, but I was tired, and I, you know, I kind of fill up the space with words. Instead of landing on the words like sin, rebellion, acted presumptuously, stiff neck, stubborn. I was stubborn. Look, at, I refused to obey. I was not mindful of your wonders. When I say honest evaluation, it's being specific with your language about who you are before a holy and righteous God. Like I remember talking with a single guy on the beach one time. He was trying to say, the Bible never says I can't have sex outside of marriage. I'm like, really? He grew up in the church. Like he listened to sermon after sermon. I said, do you know what fornicate means? Because it's in the... No, I never heard that word. Uh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> fornicate is the way the Bible describes sex outside of marriage. The Bible doesn't call sex outside of marriage sex. It calls it fornication. It's like, almost like this is a special thing. What you're doing, I'm going to call this. Like, language matters in our confession. And how does God respond every time it's with mercy that kind of looks a little different? In this case, he was patient with them, and he did not forsake them. Fast forward, verse 18. This is where the wilderness, now we get to the land of Joshua. What happens then? All right, the Israelites figured it out. Verse 18. Even when they had made, it them, made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and committed great blasphemies. What do they do? They make a golden calf to worship and say, that's our God. And we laugh and we mock, and that's what we do with our lives. We build our lives on these golden calves. It's called idolatry. And how does God respond? Verse 19, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way. You did not depart from them day and night, nor the pillar of fire by night to light them for them the way that which way they should go. Verse 20, I love this. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold manna. You led them, you fed them, you gave them water for their thirst. Verse 21, in 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Verse 22, and you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every... You gave them the land that you are in now. So they took possession of this land, the land of Sion, the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king Beshan. Verse 23, and you multiplied their children as the stars of heaven. You brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. I love that. I made your home life good. Like I gave you kids, lots of kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. I did all this. After they did what? Made a golden calf. God's now responding to their sin with mercy upon mercy. Verse 24. So the descendants went in and possessed the land. And you, God's the subject, subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand with their kings and the peoples of the land that they might do with them as they would. I'll pause right there. They made a golden calf. God responds in mercy. Honest evaluation. I am an idolatrous person. God's response, he did not forsake them. He led them by day or by night. He gave them his good spirit. He gave them food and nourishment. He gave them the kingdoms of the earth. He gave them families and children. He gave them land. And he subdued their enemies. What's that called? It's called confession. A historical recounting of all that God has done. Now we get to the book of Judges, verse 26. All right, it's going to get better. Israel, we can do this. Come on. All right, let's make a commitment. Let's all sign, you know, kind of youth group purity pledge. Let's do this. I'm never, ever, ever looking at a girl, ever, ever. 
ever, ever again. Double sign my name right now. Verse 26. Nevertheless, they were disobedient. (laughs) And rebelled against you. Listen to the language. Cast your law behind their back. And then killed the prophets. God's gracious, merciful gifts sent to them to lead them were killed. Does that sound familiar? Who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Language matters. They were disobedient. They rebelled. They cast their law behind you. And they killed your prophets. And they were blasphemous. They spoke ill of the creator God who has done nothing but good to them. And how does God respond? Verse 27. Mercy looks a little different now. Therefore you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. Hebrews says it like this. God disciplines those he loves. A good dad says it like this. My mercy is going to hurt sometimes. Because you need to learn your lesson. And now God is teaching them a lesson. And we're inching closer and closer to the very present moment they're in now. Verse 29. We got this. I mean, verse 20, end of verse 28. But after they had rest, now the kings and prophets around, they did evil again before you. What does God do? How does he respond? Mercy. By how? He abandons them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Assyria comes in, takes over the northern kingdom. Babylon takes people into exile. You want to do life according to the world's ways? I will let the world have its way with you. Some of you, your testimony in this room is about the world having its way with you. Relationships and people and situations and desires and hopes. And that's God's mercy. Verse 29, he also shows his mercy in this. And you warned them in order that they would turn their back to your law. 29 and 30. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments. It gets almost comical, but they sinned against your rules. Which a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Language matters. Like as you, as you have kids, telling the story of your life involves the sin. The specific, and that's what Israel's doing. They're like, this is our lineage. This is our family tree. This is who we are. We are a presumptuous, disobedient people. Verse 30, but... How does God respond in mercy? Many years you bore with them, and you warned them by your spirit through your prophets. Verse 30, 31, this is the last little cycle of green and red. Middle of section, verse 30 there, yet they would not give their ear. This, just so you know, this is taken like, this covers over a thousand years of time of God being Perfectly righteous, good, faithful, yet they would not give an ear. How does God respond? Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the land. This is where we're at now. Verse 31. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. What is confession? It's this communal, it's God-centric, but it's also honest with where we've come from and where we're at. Like just, I wrote in here, just those of you in this room that are figuring out the Christian life and what does confession, what's this look like? I wrote down, start with God. Like before you get to all the sin, you'll have endless time to talk about your sin, but like learn how to confess to God who God is. And then here's the other thing. Be very specific with your words. Like friends of mine that struggle with their emotional kind of awareness, usually guys, I have this chart that has all these emotions, and I always send it to them. If you're in this room, you're going to get it from me at some point if I notice. You've got like two emotions. You need to kind of amp this up a little bit. You need a little more color in your life. So I'll send it to you, and I'll say, okay, how are you feeling? Mad. Well, like what level of mad? Uh, kind of mad. Okay, kind of mad. Let's go down. Okay, you are. F- that's called frustration. Use the word. I am frustrated right now. As we learn how to confess, be specific with your words. I lusted. I was very greedy with my time last week. I disobeyed my parents 
young people. I dishonored my mother and father. Like specific with your language. Why? Because that's what confession is. It's an honest evaluation based off God's holiness. Where does that leave us? That's the end of the prayer. Now we kind of, now we're in modern day, time of Nehemiah, starting verse 32. What do they do after that prayer? Here's the last thing we see. Confession is also a reminder that we still need present day mercy. This is all past tense. This is all, our fathers did this, our fathers did this, they did this, they did this, they did this, they did this. Verse 32, now they bring it into this moment. Let's read verse 32. Now, therefore, our great, or our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us. The language now flips. It's all been them. They did this. Now they start to insert themselves into the problem. Our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of kings of Syria until this day. Verse 33, here's the summary statement of this whole message. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. For you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. Verse 34. Our kings, our princes, our priests, our fathers have not kept your law. We are included. The next chapter in this story is our sin. We did this. Verse 35, even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Verse 36, behold, we are slaves this day. Persia's in charge. Even though they're in the land, the promised land, in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good fruit gifts, behold, we are slaves. And its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies, our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. End of message of confession. What do we do with this? I think Israel just teaches us We're always in need of mercy. What's interesting, Nehemiah is the end of the Old Testament story, essentially. Like the story of the Old Testament, Israel, God, Yahweh, working with his people, being faithful. And Nehemiah is the end kind of summary statement. And the summary statement, at least at verse 37, is we are in great distress. Our sins have done this to us. Like I wanted to finish on this. Here's what I think is a better Not a better, but a concise prayer that takes all this and wraps it up into a simple little, so what? It's out of Luke chapter 18. Jesus tells a story about two people. You don't have to turn there. He told this parable to some who had trusted in themselves that they were righteous and were treating others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Pause. That's not Israel's summary statement on their life in Nehemiah. They say, we have acted corruptly. We're the issue. Verse 13, Israel would say, we're like this guy. But the tax collector, standing far off, could not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. That's the story of the Christian life in confession, is recounting who God is, who we are, and landing right here in this moment, wherever you're at, whatever's going on. It may not be slavery in the land like them, but something's in your life where you need to realize what you need is mercy. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to take a communion together. God, Thank you for the book of the Old Testament that was written so long ago, and yet it's so spot on to just how life is. It's this faithful God who comes after us and is good and is gracious and forgiving and just, and a people, even once they come into relationship with you, even when they get their life together, even when still have 
endless opportunities to say, God, I confess that I'm a sinner. So God, help us as a church to build this muscle of communal confession, of this corporate realization that we need mercy. God, I confess that I often compare myself to others and I think I've arrived. God, that's sin. That's pride. That's arrogance. That's boastful eyes, which you say you hate. So God, this room is full of sin, full of sinners, and yet we acknowledge your goodness and your faithfulness. God, meet us even as we respond to your word. Just in our prayer.